All right, chemists, welcome. This is Ralston Valley High School's AP Chemistry Lecture Series, Chapter 12, Lecture Number 1 on Kinetics and specifically the Differential Rate Law. Let's get started. All right, to get started here, we are looking at an area of chemistry that likely you have not experienced before in your first year chemistry class. Uh, here at Ralston Valley, we are looking now at chemical kinetics. Thinking back to your physics days, kinetics is all about rates of change. And in particular, in chemical kinetics, we're going to be interested in rates of chemical reaction. And additionally, uh, the mechanisms by which those reactions proceed. That is, the individual stepwise events which occur during the course of a chemical reaction. Now, we've recently been talking a little bit about thermodynamics. And in particular, thermodynamics we use to determine whether or not a reaction was spontaneous, that is, whether a reaction was actually likely to occur of its own accord, um, given the therm thermodynamic nature of that process. Now, whereas thermodynamics was fantastic at telling us what occurred, it did very little to tell us the rate or how fast that reaction actually occurred. So we're really dividing our understanding of a chemical reaction into two clearly distinct parts. Number one, the initial and final conditions of a chemical system in terms of the changes in chemical energy that take place over the course of a reaction. That is the domain of thermodynamics that helps us to determine spontaneity and whether an event is thermodynamically favorable. On the other hand, how we get from our initial starting point to our final point, that is how you get from point A to point B, is really the domain of chemical kinetics. And this will be our focus of today's lecture. Now, if I can draw your attention for a moment here to the images on our slide, you'll see you've got two images, both of which involve a reaction between a metal and oxygen. In the image on the left, we have a very rapid reaction taking place in which magnesium burns in the presence of oxygen in a sparkler for some fireworks there. In the image on the right, we see a very, very slow rate of reaction in which iron metal rusts. Now, the thermodynamic favorability of both of these reactions is similar. That is, from a thermodynamics perspective, both of these reactions are spontaneous events which occur without outside intervention. But very clearly, there is a difference in the kinetics of these reactions, whereas the fireworks reaction proceeds rapidly. The rate of rusting is a very, very slow process for iron metal. And that's really what we're going to be looking at today, is why it is that some reactions proceed fast versus slow. Now, in particular, getting started here, we're going to start by defining here what we mean by a rate of reaction. You are familiar from your physics days about various other rates, in particular, a rate in change of distance with respect to time is defined as velocity from your physics days, or a rate of change of velocity with respect to time would be a familiar one called acceleration. But here in chemistry, we're specifically going to be talking about a rate of chemical reaction, which we're going to define as the rate of change in concentration of a particular species per unit of time. That is, the change in concentration divided by the change in time over a course of a reaction. That change in concentration can either be defined in terms of the decreasing concentration of a reactant, or in terms of the increasing concentration of a product during the course of a reaction. And as this rate of reaction is defined as a change in concentration with respect to time, we would expect to see units of moles per liter per second for our reaction rates. That is, a change in molarity with respect to time. All right, now, as we alluded to on a previous slide here, we can define and determine a rate of reaction by the changes in concentration of any species present in the system, whether it's a reactant or a product. And to give you an example of this idea, what we're going to look for in this example problem here is how it is that we can define the rate of reaction of one species as a function of the rate of change in concentration of another species present in the system. So let's go ahead and have a look at example number one here, in which we are going to be considering the decomposition reaction listed there, in which the species N2O5, that is dinitrogen pentoxide, is decomposing to produce nitrogen dioxide, that is NO2, and oxygen gas, which is O2. Now, first and foremost, what I want you to pay attention to here are the mole ratios described by the balanced chemical equation. That is, two moles of N2O5 decomposes to make four moles of NO2 and only one mole of O2. So what we're being asked to do here is to define the rate of reaction as a function of the changing concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide gas, 
in comparison to the change in concentrations of the other two species present there, that is the nitrogen dioxide and the oxygen. Let's go ahead and focus, first of all, about how we can compare the rate of reaction defined in terms of the N2O5 as opposed to the O2. Looking at my mole ratio in this balanced chemical equation, you'll see that two moles of N2O5 decompose to produce only one mole of oxygen gas O2. Another way of stating that is that the rate of change in concentration of oxygen, therefore, would be half that of the rate of change of concentration of N2O5. Since, again, N2O5 is consumed at twice the rate that O2 is produced. And so I could set up a mathematical expression that shows that idea. That is to say that the rate of change in concentration of oxygen, O2, with respect to time, so that is delta concentration of O2 over delta T, would be equal to one-half times the rate of change in concentration of the dinitrogen pentoxide, which would be delta concentration N2O5, divided by delta T. Now, one other thing to note here, importantly, the change in concentration of N2O5 as this reaction proceeds, assuming we start off initially with all reactants present, would be a decrease in concentration, therefore a negative slope, whereas the change in concentration of oxygen with respect to time would have a positive slope, which means I'm going to have to put a negative in front of the change in concentration of my N2O5 to make it so that those two expressions are equal to one another. So I end up with the overall expression shown on your page there relating the change in concentration of oxygen with respect to time as a function of the change in concentration of N2O5 with respect to time. I can repeat that same process now, this time showing the change in concentration of the N2O5 with respect to time as opposed to the change in concentration of the other product species there, which is the change in concentration of NO2 with respect to time. So same idea, start by looking at the mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation. This time, I see that for every two moles of N2O5 that are consumed, I produce four moles of NO2, implying, therefore, that NO2 is produced at a rate which is double that of the rate at which N2O5 is consumed. And therefore, translating that idea into a mathematical statement, I would get the expression, which is my change in concentration of the NO2 with respect to a change in time, would be equal to two times the change in concentration of the N2O5 with respect to time. And again, recognizing that the N2O5 is decreasing in concentration as the NO2 is increasing in concentration, I will need to put a negative in front of the rate at which N2O5 is consumed in order to make this a true mathematical statement. So long story short, by looking at the mole ratios from the balanced chemical equations, we can produce mathematical statements that talk about how one rate of change in concentration is related to another within our chemical system. All right, and what we have here now on this next slide is essentially a graphical representation of the reaction that was described in the last example problem. That is the reaction describing the decomposition of the species N2O5. And you'll see we have the three species present in our system um, and how they change in concentration over time reflected in this graph. You'll see the two products, that is the species NO2, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen gas O2, both start off at initial concentrations of zero and increase in concentration over time as the decomposition reaction proceeds. Whereas the species N2O5 initially starts off here at a concentration of 0.10 molar and over time decreases in concentration. Now, what we're looking for in this particular graph is not where the lines intersect. Those simply just happen to be the places where the concentrations of two spe species happen to be equal to one another. But what I really want to be looking at here is the slopes of these graphs. Because, again, remember, what we're looking at here is a rate of change of concentration. So have a look for me here. Uh, first of all, comparing the two products, that is, the species NO2 and O2. Again, they both start off at initial concentrations of zero, but you'll see that the nitrogen dioxide, NO2, increases concentration at a much, much greater rate than that of oxygen, O2. In fact, it increases concentration at four times the rate at which uh, oxygen is increasing in concentration. And again, that's a recognition that the mole ratio uh, between oxygen and NO2 is a 1 to 4 mole ratio, 
which then again makes logical sense that we produce NO2 faster than we produce oxygen. Um, now, comparing my reactant species, that is the species N205, if we look at its slope at any given point in time over the course of this reaction, the slope of N205 is, number one, a negative slope, indicating that the species is decreasing in concentration. And comparing the magnitude of the slopes of these species, the magnitude of the slope of the line indicating the concentration versus time graph of the reactant N205 is half the magnitude of the slope at any given time of the concentration versus time graph for the species NO2, recognizing again that within the balanced chemical equation, my mole ratio of N205 to NO2 is a mole ratio of 2 to 4. So at any given point in time, if you compare again the slopes of the lines for the blue line indicating the reactant species N205 versus the red line indicating the product species NO2, you will see that the steepness, that is the slope of the blue line, is always less steep at any given point in time than the slope of the red line, again, recognizing that we've got that 2 to 4 mole ratio uh, between those two species within our balanced chemical equation. Similarly, if we now compare the slope of the yellow line indicating the concentration of oxygen over time versus the slope of the blue line indicating again our reactant N205, you'll see that the slope of the line representing oxygen's concentration over time is always less steep than the slope of the blue line, that is, the changing concentration of N205. And again, that is a recognition that oxygen is produced at a rate which is only one-half that at which the species N205 is consumed, indicating again there is a slower rate of production of oxygen than the rate at which N205 is consumed. So again, same sort of idea, but this time just in graphical representation. We can now move on to our next slide. All right, now moving on, let's go ahead and have a quick conversation about which factors might influence a rate of a chemical reaction. Uh, there's a variety of different things we can do to affect rates of reaction, some of them which are familiar to you, as we see here in our picture on the slide here of a refrigerator slowing down the rate at which food spoils. Uh, some of them might be a little bit less familiar and require a little bit more uh, thought and attention. So first and foremost, uh, the first thing we want to look at here is always the nature of the chemical reaction. Uh, some chemical reactions have particular qualities that make them occur either particularly fast or slow. For example, um, you might have a chemical reaction which has either a particularly high or a particularly low activation energy barrier, which might then indicate... Um, why a rate of reaction happens to be either fast or slow correspondingly. An example of this type of effect might be a reaction such as the decomposition of nitrogen triiodide into elemental nitrogen and iodine. Uh, nitrogen triiodide is an incredibly unstable chemical species that is sensitive, so sensitive to vibrational energy that it actually will explosively decompose at the touch of even a feather if it is dry. And from that we can infer that nitrogen triiodide must therefore have a particularly low activation energy barrier um, for its reaction to proceed, which indicates then why the reaction is so fast as it proceeds, that is so explosive. That might be in comparison to another chemical reaction that would have a particularly high activation energy barrier. And for a reaction with a very high activation energy barrier, we might expect that most collisions involving the particles would not have sufficient energy to get the reaction to the point of the activated complex, which would imply, therefore, a likely low rate of chemical reaction. So the nature of the reaction itself in terms of what collisions have to take place, in terms of activation energy barriers, all of that will have an influence on a rate of reaction. You might even consider something about the geometry of the reactant, uh, reactant molecules in terms of how we might see the nature of the reaction affect a reaction rate. Let's say, for example, that two species in order to react need to um, collide together in a particular orientation in space so that the active sites on those molecules can interact chemically speaking. If those sites are somehow blocked by the geometry of the molecule, that is, if there's not easy access for the collision to take place, 
that might imply that the reaction would be an unlikely event to take place due to a random collision, and as such, we might see a lower rate of reaction as a result. So factors like that about the nature of the reaction are a primary driving factor about reaction rates. Um, the next one is a very obvious one, that is the concentration of the reactants because collision theory tells us that reactant species must collide together with sufficient energy to uh, react together to produce products, it would likely follow, therefore, that the higher the concentration of the reactants in the chemical system, the higher the likelihood that those collisions would take place, and therefore a faster rate of reaction. So concentration of reactants is therefore a factor that definitely influences reaction rates, as is, by that same logic, temperature. Again, because when particles collide together, they must collide together with sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier for a chemical reaction to proceed. At higher temperatures, more of those collisions would involve sufficient energy of collision to overcome that activation energy barrier, and we'd expect, therefore, to see a faster rate of reaction overall. So generally, increasing the temperature has the net effect of increasing rates of chemical reaction. And last but not least, uh, the presence of a catalyst. This is something which we've discussed to some degree in the thermodynamics units. But recall, a catalyst provides an alternate pathway upon which a reaction can proceed, which generally has a lower activation energy barrier. So the introduction of a catalyst into a chemical system will generally see more of the collisions between particles result in successful collisions to form products due to the lowered barrier uh, for the activation energy. And as such, we would generally see a faster rate of reaction overall. All right, so always good to keep kind of in the back of your mind uh, which of these factors might influence a rate of chemical reaction. This is the type of question the AP likes to ask you about in a qualitative sense um, to understand why it is that chemical reactions might proceed in either a fast or slow manner. All right, so now that we have spoken qualitatively about how different factors influence rates of chemical reaction, it's now time to spend some uh, time with some quantitative measurements in terms of rates of chemical reaction involving what we refer to as a rate law. A rate law is essentially an expression that describes how a rate of reaction is dependent upon the concentration of the reactants present. Uh, this is a generic term for a rate law. We'll also refer to it sometimes as a differ differential rate law. The form that rate law takes on is always going to be the, as follows. Uh, we describe a rate of reaction as being dependent upon some constant times the concentration of the reactant species raised to some exponent powers multiplied by one another where the constant in the system is a constant given here the letter k in our expression, we ref refer to this as the rate constant. Please note here that this particular constant here has absolutely nothing to do with the equilibrium constant keq. So this is a different k. Apologies that chemists have not come up with another letter to differentiate these two constants. So uh, then that is again a differential rate law that tells me how rate of reaction is dependent upon concentration of the reactants present. That is in contrast to another way of expressing a rate law, which is what we refer to as the integrated rate law, whereas the differential rate law is a rate versus concentration relationship, the integrated rate law describes how a rate of reaction is dependent upon the time since the reaction began occurring. So that is the integrated rate law is a rate versus time relationship. These rate laws can only be determined experimentally. Now, how we go about determining the rate law and whether we use a differential or an integrated rate law is really dependent upon how convenient it is for us to collect data in terms of what type of data is easy for us to collect. That is, is it easier for us to collect rate versus time data or rate versus concentration data? We'll really determine how we go about finding the rate law. The nice thing is, if you know the rate law of one of them, that is, if you know the integrated rate law, you can always use that then to find the differential rate law and vice versa. Now, importantly here, folks, that rate law is, as we mentioned, only determined experimentally. That is to say, the rate law has nothing to do with the mole ratios from a balanced chemical equation. It can be very, very tempting to think that the rate law would be essentially looking like a equilibrium constant expression where the exponent values x and y, that's what we call the order of these reactions, are some way related to the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. But as it turns out, that is very much not the case. So please make sure to keep separate in your mind 
the balanced chemical equations, mole ratios, versus the order of the reaction, which again are those exponent values x and y within our rate law. Now, the reason a chemist might be interested in understanding the rate law of a chemical reaction is that the rate law itself allows chemists to infer the individual elementary steps that might occur as a chemical reaction proceeds. That is, it gives us some degree of insight into what things might be actually happening on the molecular scale in terms of collisions between particular reactant species, presence of particular intermediates, that might then tell us about the actual process by which a chemical reaction occurs on the atomic or molecular level. All right, so with that now taken care of, let's take a look at one particular type of rate law problem that is commonly assessed on the AP chemistry test. All right, so what we're going to have a look at here for our last slide in this lecture is a type of problem we refer to as an initial rates method problem to determine the differential rate law of a uh, reaction. The initial rates method is going to compare uh, several different experiments uh, in which we change the initial concentration of one reacting species at a time, and each time we measure the initial rate of reaction in terms of the change in concentration of one species present in the system. We are then going to use one of two different methods to determine what we call the order of reaction with respect to each species, that is essentially, we want to find the exponent values x and y within our differential rate law, uh, either by, number one, an inspection as to how changing the concentration of a species affects the rate of reaction. We call that the inspection method. Or, number two, by a mathematical proof. So let's go ahead and take a look at the example problem, and we'll show you the two different methods for uh, doing this. Uh, in this example here, we have a generic problem in which two chemical reactant species A and B are combining together to produce the product C, and we are running a reaction three different times each time, uh, changing the concentrations of the reactant species A and B, and seeing how those changing initial concentrations affect the initial rate of production of species C in units of moles per liter per second of that product species being produced. So let's go ahead and have a look first at the inspection method here that allows us to determine our rate law. Recall the generic form of a rate law here is going to be the rate of reaction is equal to the rate constant K times the reactant concentration A raised to the exponent power X times the concentration of the reactant B raised to the exponent power Y. And let's go ahead and have a look now with that generic form to see how we might go about determining the exponent powers x and y from the data provided to us here. The first thing I want to do is I would like to compare the experiments 1 and 2 from our data table. You'll notice between experiments number 1 and 2 that the species B does not change in concentration in these two experiments. Because B is held constant at concentration, that implies any change in the rate of reaction would therefore be due to the changing concentration of the reactant species A. So have a look now at the relative rates of reaction between experiments number 1 and 2. You'll notice that experiment 2 has a reaction rate which is essentially double that of the rate of reaction for experiment 1. That is, species C is produced at twice the rate in experiment 2 than it is in experiment 1. And also notice that the concentration initially of species A in our system is also double in experiment 2 as compared to experiment number 1. And what that really implies, therefore, is doubling the concentration of A has the net effect of doubling the rate of production of species C. And as such, we would then say for this reaction, the reaction is first order with respect to A. That is, the rate of reaction is dependent upon A's concentration raised to the first power. So now that we understand the order of the reaction with respect to A, it's time to move on and look at how the concentration of species B affects the rate of reaction. In order to determine the order for species B, I now want to examine experiments numbers 2 and 3. Again, look to see that A's concentration remains constant between experiments 2 and 3 implying any change in the rate of reaction between experiments number 2 and 3 must therefore be a result of the changing concentration of species B. So again, by inspection here, well, let's go ahead and compare reaction experiment 2 to experiment 3. In experiment 2, the rate of production of species C is 3.0 times 10 to the 3rd moles per liter per second.
as opposed to in experiment three, where that rate of production of species C is 1.2 times 10 to the negative two moles per liter per second. That is a rate of production of C four times faster in experiment three than in experiment two. So as such, as doubling B's concentration increases the rate of production of species C by a factor of four, that would imply that the rate of production of species C is therefore dependent upon B's concentration raised to the second power. And as such, we would say that this reaction, therefore, is second order with respect to species B. So therefore, I could write a rate law by saying the rate of reaction is equal to some constant K times A's concentration raised to the first power times B's concentration raised to the second power. So again, this reaction is first order with respect to A, second order with respect to B, and we would say, therefore, the overall order of the reaction would be third order by summing the individual orders with respect to each species. So we now have a generic form of the rate law. Let's go ahead and show another method for determining this by mathematical proof. In some instances, a simple inspection can be difficult to deal with in terms of the types of problems the AP test tends to give you. Particularly, in some cases, they will give you experiments where no species is held constant between two different experiments. And as such, simple inspection becomes more difficult to do. So in this method, we need now a mathematical basis by which we can determine the orders of the reaction. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a pathway to find that uh, order of reaction by essentially mathematical proof. So as a starting point here, let's go ahead and begin with the generic form of our rate law, which is going to be that the rate of reaction is equal to some constant k times a's concentration raised to the x power times b's concentration raised to the y power. And now let's again use the data from experiments 1 and 2 to determine the order of our reaction, but this time by proving it with the math. So I'm going to go ahead and start by writing the rate law as defined by experiments 2's data. That is, the rate of production of species C from experiment 2, that is, the reaction rate, is 3.0 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second in experiment 2. So that rate of reaction by our rate law would therefore be equal to some constant K times the concentration of species A, which again in experiment 2 is 0 0.0020 molar, and that uh, concentration is raised to the x power, times the concentration of species B, which in this case in experiment 2 is 0 0.0050 molar raised to the y power. So I've now written the rate law as defined by the data in experiment number 2. And now here's the big trick. I'm going to go ahead now and divide that rate law by the rate law as defined by experiment 1. So that is, looking at experiment 1, my rate of reaction was 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. And that rate would be equal to the same constant K times now A's concentration from experiment 1, which was 0 0.0010 molar raised to the x power, times B's concentration from experiment 1, which was 0 0.0050 molar raised to the y power. And by dividing the rate law from the second experiment by the rate law from the first experiment, let's go ahead and see the, how the math works out. So in looking at the left-hand side of the equation, we'll see here that I have 3 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second divided by 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. That's going to give me a value of 2. And again, note that those units of moles per liter per second are going to cancel out there. So that is going to be equal to now on the right-hand side of our equation here. Notice that we have the same rate constant k, both in the numerator and denominator now, which means we can cancel those out. And also notice that the concentration of species B of 0 0.0050 molar is the same in both equations, which means that value of 0 0.0050 molar raised to the y power will also cancel out. So essentially what I end up with now is 0 0.0020 molar to the x power divided by 0 0.0010 molar to the x power which I can then simplify and condense there down to essentially a ratio of 0 0.0020 divided by 0 0.0010, all raised to the x power. My equation now becomes, on the left side, 2 is equal to, on my right side, 2 to the x power, and therefore x is equal to 1, which again matches what we'd expected to see from our previous inspection method as we discussed earlier, implying therefore 
that this reaction again is first order with respect to species A. So now that I know the order with respect to species A, let's now go ahead and do the same process, but now comparing experiments numbers two and three. So this time I'm gonna define the rate law as defined by the data from experiment three, and we'll divide that rate law by the rate law as defined by experiment two's data. So now my generic rate law is rate of reaction is equal to the rate constant K times A's concentration raised to the first power, again, since I know that this is first order with respect to A, times B's concentration, again, raised to the Y power. Now, the rate law defined from experiment three would be our rate of reaction of 1.2 times 10 to the negative two moles per liter per second is equal to the rate constant K times A's concentration of 0 0.0020 molar, now raised to the first power, times B's concentration of 0 0.0100 molar from experiment three, raised to the Y power. And again, I'm gonna divide that by the rate law defined from experiment two, which would be the rate of reaction of 3.0 times 10 to the negative three moles per liter per second. That rate is equal to the rate constant K, times A's concentration of 0 0.0020 molar raised to the first power, times B's concentration of 0 0.0050 molar, again raised to the Y power. And again, canceling out terms that show up both in the numerator and denominator on both sides of my equation, we'll see here on the left-hand side, I've got a ratio of those rates, which is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 2 divided by 3.0 times 10 to the negative 3, which is 4, uh, again, moles per liter per second are going to cancel out there, so I get the expression 4 is equal to, and on the right-hand side of my equation, again, the rate constant K is going to cancel out, and you'll also notice that the value of 0 0.0020 molar raised to the first power also cancels out. So all that's left on the right side of my equation is 0 0.0100 molar divided by 0 0.0050 molar, all raised to the Y power. So essentially now my equation will simplify down to, on the left side, 4 is equal to, and on the right-hand side, that ratio becomes now 2 to the y power. So 4 is 2 to the y, y therefore would be a value obviously equal here to 2. Again, proving that this reaction is second order with respect to species y. And as such, you'll see here that our order of reaction, as determined by mathematical proof, is exactly the same as the order of reaction as we had discovered by inspection earlier in our discussion here. So all that remains now for cleanup is, let's go ahead and figure out what the value of that rate constant K actually is. Uh, easy approach right now would be to just take data from any one of the experiments, again, it's a constant, so it doesn't matter which one you choose, and plug that data from that experiment into our now newly determined rate law. So I'm gonna go ahead and just for ease of use here, use experiment number one. Uh, my rate of reaction as defined by experiment number one is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter per second. And again, that rate is equal to the rate constant K times A's concentration, which in experiment one is 0 0.0010 molar, all raised to the first power, since again, it's first order with respect to A, times B's concentration, in experiment one of 0 0.0050 molar raised to the second power, again, since we are second order with respect to B. And you'll see right now, all we're missing there is the value of the rate constant K, so I can go ahead and do a quick mathematical manipulation of this equation to solve for K. To isolate K, I'm gonna divide both sides of my equation by everything on the right-hand side there, which was 0 0.0010 molar times 0 0.0050 molar squared. So dividing both sides of my equation by that value will cancel out all of that stuff on the right-hand side except for the rate constant K. And now on the left-hand side, watch here what we end up getting here. We have now 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 divided by 0 0.0010 times 0 0.0050 squared. And as we make that division right here, I find a value of K of 60,000 for this particular rate constant. Now, importantly here, folks, um, almost every single time the AP test will ask you about rate constant, they're always going to ask you about the units on the rate constant as well. So let's be very careful here to watch what happens to our units on the left side of our equation. Uh, note again, we had in the top of the 
numerator, we had the units of moles per liter per second. In the denominator, I had moles per liter times moles per liter squared. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out one of the moles per liter because it shows up both in the numerator and denominator. And as I do so, notice that seconds is going to remain in my denominator for the units. And then what I end up with is essentially 1 over moles per liter squared, which would therefore give me units of liters squared divided by moles squared times seconds. And at this point, we now have enough information to write our complete rate law, including the value of that rate constant k. So our overall rate law would be the rate of reaction is equal to the rate constant k of 60,000 liters squared per mole squared second times the concentration of species A raised to the first power, that is, again, it is first order with respect to A, times the concentration of species B, raised to the second power, that is, this reaction is second order with respect to B. So long story short, pretty much every single time you do one of these problems on the AP test, uh, what they're going to ask you to find is the value of the rate constant, and then they're going to ask you a separate question, that is, what is the units on that rate constant as well? Um, it's one of their favorite follow-up questions to ask in free response sections. All right, so at this point, we've now determined our rate law, including the value of the rate constant k, both by inspection and by mathematical proof. Um, most of the time on the AP test, you're able to choose which method you want to use. Um, if you do choose to use the inspection method, be sure you're ready to justify your choices based upon the changing rates of reaction as a function of the initial concentrations of each species. So math is a very, very good way of explaining things here. It's fairly straightforward how you can get to that. If you are going to use the inspection method, do be prepared to justify your reasoning. And this concludes our discussion of differential rate laws. Uh, we'll see you in the next lecture.